Come gather round the campfire and hear our ghostly tales of chilling terrors, darkest woes, and anything that goes bump in the night. So cuddle up with your best friend or dare it alone. The darkness is closing in and spirits are calling your name. This is Fireside Phantoms. some debate out there saying CERN, and I'll explain what CERN is, could be haunted or even have paranormal entities interfering with its functions. I bet it does. It is, after all, a very large machine which creates massive energy. So CERN is the nuclear research facility that has the largest hadron particle accelerator in the world. What is the hadron collider? I ask, what is it? The Hadron Collider is buried 300 feet underground and measures 17 miles across. Did Elon Musk make it? (laughs) No, he wishes. The machine accelerates particles at high speeds, reaching almost to the speed of light and smashes them together to see how our galaxy was formed and what unique reactions might occur from the collision. And maybe blow us all up in the process. No. Oh, you're getting way ahead of me. (laughs) Um, It has nine... 1,600 super magnets that create 100,000 times more gravitational pull than Earth. CERN is located in Geneva, Switzerland and crosses the France border. Now, it's interesting to note that the location is believed that in Roman times, a temple existed there in honor of Apollo. Wow. And the ancient people who lived there believed this location was a gateway to the underworld. So there were subterranean tunnels that there led might to hell be. underneath the CERN hydrogen oh, cl- hi- it is, hadron collider. It is buried underground. And it's interesting to note that CERN is built on this same spot, having a Latin name meaning Apollyon, which, by the way, is that angel that is supposed to be the gatekeeper over um, the portal of hell or something like that. I don't know. Wow. It's something like that. That's very just dark and disturbing. Yeah. Now, CERN, though, has had some quite notable accomplishments. Some of CERN's experiments were to study the Big Bang Theory and antimatter. They also were hoping to find evidence of the higgs boson particle, yes. which is also named the ghost, we'd like that, Yes. or god particle, which yes. they say gives particles their mass and makes up the fabric of the universe. So basically, Holly... Mm-hmm. And for our Star Wars fans, we're talking about the Force. Yes. The Force. Yes. Well, that sounds harmless enough, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, CERN physicists have claimed to have the proof of seeing evidence of the Higgs boson particle on July 4th, 2012. And don't tell Al Gore, but CERN also claimed to have given birth to the Internet. Did you know that? No. Yeah, they did. They claim to have given birth? To the internet. What yeah. about Tim Berners-Lee? Didn't he no. have something to do with no, that? I don't know. Okay. But it's CERN. Okay. CERN, CERN. Thanks, CERN. CERN is in control of everything. Wow. Uh, yeah. No. They're like the dark shadow government. <laughs> they created the dark web uh, as well. I don't know. There's a lot of conspiracies around CERN. Oh, cool. Um, and there have also been some experiments producing much concern in the general scientific community and region. In 2009, just one year after the collider started running, a report from Russia accused CERN of unleashing a time wave when a blackout happened at CERN. Now, this incident was ultimately blamed on a piece of bagel dropped by a bird into the machine, somehow causing it to malfunction. And an Airbus on its way from Bolivia to Spain somehow teleported to the Canary Islands with all 170 passengers on board. No way. I know. It was said that CERN caused a ripple that disturbed Earth's magnetic field. Of course, most just shrugged this off as conspiracy. But on June 16, 2016, CERN began a new experiment called AWAKE. I mean, just even the names of their experiments are so fun. Wow. It was soon widely noticed that weird cloud and sky anomalies were appearing right above CERN, and reports of paranormal activity were also happening inside CERN. Anonymous posts by supposed employees discussing hearing these really strange sounds of tortured screams and also hearing a low humming noise. 
Like they can hear into hell, essentially. Okay, I wasn't going to say yeah, that. Yeah, but that's what they're doing. But basically, they're tapping into the vows of hell. That's that's really actually. Thank you for saying that. I didn't want to go there, but that's really what came to mind yeah. oh when they God. were describing it. Oh my and God. I know. I'm going to church right now. I know. And then one photographer, Christoph Suarez, captured amazing photographs showing these really dark, abnormal cloud formations and also a weird circular cloud ring appeared up in the sky on radar on July 5th, 2016, which, Holly, which coincided shortly before an emergency shutdown happened at CERN. Now, CERN's official report said a squirrel or a weasel. (laughs) It's always this. A squirrel or a weasel jumped the fence and was electrocuted by the transformer. And supposedly they have proof they've stuffed him and have him on display at a natural history museum in Rotterdam. Hmm. But stories just started getting weirder and weirder. You would think a bunch of geniuses could figure out how to keep the wildlife from crashing their machine. You would think that just a little squirrel wouldn't cause all that ruckus. I know. Well, CERN has denied any changes they have caused to our weather, but they did admit that some of their experiments were done to create artificial clouds in order to understand global warming. So then the the cloud formations that people have seen are actually something that they've created. I think so. Interesting. They deny it. You know, I will say that in researching this online, I did find some crazy pictures and videos of weather and clouds right above the facility, and it isn't normal behavior. Hmm. One convincing video shows a cloud spiraling in the sky and radiating movement as if pulling atmosphere into itself. Like a tornado? Almost like a black hole. Like Ooh. Pulling in See, everything. isn't that one of the fears they have is that CERN will open up a black hole and Earth will be sucked into it and we'll all die? Well, people who don't understand black holes think that, but honestly, black holes... Are you trying holes... to say I don't understand black holes? <laughs> I understand them fine, Carol. Um, they used to be fearful of that, but really when, when you understand black holes, um, it... It really, if they do start a black hole, it would be millions and millions and millions of years before it got big enough to swallow our planet. But, I mean, it could swallow Switzerland, and that's sad. (laughs) We're so sorry, Switzerland. I really like the cows over there and the food. and the the They've got great fondue. Oh, my God. We don't want to lose that country. That would would suck. No. But isn't CERN right on the border? Between Switzerland and... That's um, what I said, yep. The border of France. Thank you, France. I do remember watching a YouTube video about a scientist or physicist that said um, they're doubting that what they saw was actually the higgs boson particle, although they did claim it publicly. They had a lot of theories about what they were going to find, and when they did the tests, it was not what they thought. And I do believe that the tests and the information that they're getting is allowing them to see... That um, I remember doing it on portals and that portals can actually be a thing because I remember that what they were finding out at CERN was kind of confirming that portals could exist. And Albert Einstein also said that that was true. Portals could exist from what I remember of that story. And it was about the four. It was the freaky forest ones where people would go into the forest Mm -hmm. and disappear Um, And they believe that there were natural portals in these forests that would suck people in. Well, many fears have been publicly expressed from top level scientists, including Stephen Hawking, who said the God particle found by CERN could destroy our universe. And he continued saying the Higgs boson could become unstable at very high energy levels and have the potential to trigger a catastrophic vacuum decay which would cause space and time to collapse, and we would not have any warning at all. Oh, good. Well, at least we aren't going to sit there and be freaked out. We won't have time. We'll just be dead. That's right. Yeah. And then I'm sure you saw the video circulating online back in 2016 of what appeared to be a group of people reenacting a ritual sacrifice dressed in black hoods, brandishing a shiny knife with a young lady wearing white, pretending to be sacrificed on the grounds of CERN, (laughs) <laughs> what? No. Well, this video went viral and CERN launched an investigation into the incident saying it was just a prank pulled by some of their scientists. Nothing that to sounds see here. creepy weird. Yeah. But let's consider a few other ominous examples 
Like, for example, their bizarre celebration depicting something like a goat dance orgy at the opening ceremony of the Gothard Base Tunnel, which suggested a connection with CERN, despite being 300 miles apart. Huh. Now, some people theorize that the symbology there is to suggest CERN will be conducting experiments in that tunnel. Isn't that crazy? Interesting. Okay. The fact that CERN's mascot is a gifted statue from the Indian government and is the demigod Shiva for creation, death, and destruction, and that their logo also appears to have the ominous number 666, and the art opera film Symmetry was filmed at CERN, which also depicts CERN workers dancing in their underwear and lots of groping, well, there is some skepticism about their true motives, you know. Conspiracies are running wild about this place. So the, all of that speaks to like satanic worship type stuff. It does. It's kind of it's kind of creepy. It's very creepy and weird. It really because is. it's not a religion. I mean, at least I didn't think CERN was a religious institution by any means. Mm -hmm. It was pure science. Well, some people are saying that CERN knows what they're dealing with is basically creation itself. And that is really you're playing the part of god right so they all have a god complex maybe but sergio bertolucci i hope i say that right sergio bertolucci a former director for research and scientific computing at cern has openly said it is possible to open a portal or doorway to another dimension using the hadron collider yes and was also said quote out of this door might come something or we might send something through it. Of course, added Bertolucci, after this tiny moment, the door would again shut, bringing us back to our normal four-dimensional world. And it would be a major leap in our vision of nature. And of course, there would be no risk to the stability of our world. He's so confident, isn't he? Mm -hmm. But CERN is super cold. It's 1.9 Kelvin colder than outer space. Really? It makes the magnet super conductive, so they keep it that way. And you know ghosts and cold air. They like that. Mm -hmm. So how how does that translate into degrees? Like how cool would that be in degrees? I don't know my Kelvin conversion matter. Why not, Carol? Because I'm not a freaking scientist. Did you not pay Pauline? attention in school? Now, also the beam produces a resonance. So a perfect ghost machine, in my opinion. Also... Also, on some forum boards and YouTube videos, current employees and former employees of CERN have stated that there are many malfunctions which are causing major setbacks to their work. As a matter of fact, one of the scientists who has done a short video regarding his everyday work at CERN claims every day it seems some crazy failure happens or unpredictable interference in their systems and it will ruin his work and interfere with many hours of his research and data hmm. don't you think that that is probably just the um guardian angels stopping them from destroying the planet that's also probably my theory on it because we know that there's specific examples of computer systems crashing and shutting down without warning we know this happens mm -hmm. but to have it happen over and over again and it seems to be when they're at a critical state of trying to figure out something that it happens they also have said unexplainable figures and objects are seen tampering within their computer screens. Really? And that's just downright scary. Ew, that is creepy. To see like something in your machine while you're working on your laptop, that would be freaky. I mean, if you think about it, if like if you're going to go full board with the theory that there is an afterlife, that there are angels or other um, demons, energies around us all the time. CERN could very well be opening up a dimensional portal for these uh, entities to come through and mm -hmm. to fuck with their shit. Right. Know? And no official comment from CERN has confirmed any of this to be true. But some strange timings of these malfunctions eerily happen when other bizarre mm. phenomenon are reported. For yeah. example... There are reports of employees feeling deja vu as if they are repeating days. Ye gads, the, you know, some of these workers, I think they just have fatigue going on. So they have a Groundhog Day thing going on. They there. do. And one story called the bread incident reports at the same time as a CERN system failure. A huge blackout was also reported to have happened in Brazil, which caused the majority of the entire population to be without power for several hours. Oh, wow. Are these events 
worldwide related to energy issues at CERN on the same day? Most would say no, but the state prosecutors of Brazil is saying they have found no evidence of damage to power lines or the main hydroelectric plants in their nation. Nothing was ever found to be wrong with the grid and without doing any repairs, the power just came back up by itself. Wow. November 6th just happened to be the date when other workers at CERN said a week had passed by and they couldn't remember time passing. And they all thought it was still the same day of November 6th. So they lost time. Yeah. Oh, really? Give these guys some fresh air and some Mountain Dew, please. <laughs> do the but do. Just do the do. Just let them go out and skateboard and ski for a while. And do they're going to be fine. Yeah, some adrenaline sports. But apparently that week also, they had a well-documented list of UFO sightings also in the same region of oh, CERN. Of course they do. So, Holly, just like your angel theory, I wonder if our alien friends are trying to put a stop to these crazy experiments. I could see that they would want to. That could potentially yeah. destroy our yeah. planet. Yeah. Many scientists have theorized the large amounts of energy being pulled from the atmosphere is interfering with quantum matter worldwide and that it is dangerous because weather's changing, sinkholes are opening up, and there is fear that our relationship with time itself is being affected. Religious groups say CERN is trying to play the role of God and it will someday backfire. Oh. Some strange claims are saying that CERN is trying to open a portal into another dimension. So imagine that there are multiple universes or realities and each universe is a thin page in a very thick book. The pages in ink will never bleed or affect other pages, yet they can all exist together in the same time-space continuum. But back in the 1980s, there was billions of dollars of research to support the idea that if there was enough force of energy concentrated into a very small area, and we're talking about the size of a penhole, you could, in theory, poke through our page and get a peek at the next page. And now CERN does not say they're currently experimenting with trying to find the fifth dimension, but I doubt, I doubt highly that all that research money was spent on just a hypothetical what-if scenario. Mm. And in researching this further, Holly, it seems that the Rockefellers have a lot of financial interest in funding CERN, even sponsoring certain scientists. In January 2019, CERN officials revealed their potential plan for a giant 62-mile circular collider. Really? So they're wanting to expand. Of course. And even though the LHC is not the only collider in the world, there's actually several, itself is just one of the biggest in the entire world. So to go from 17 miles to 62 miles is a huge jump. Huge. And the Hadron Collider itself is currently undergoing upgrades. The collider was shut down in 2018. The Hydronic Collider is now scheduled to run again in 2021. <laughs> At least Great. they were smart enough to shut it down in 2020, right? Not a good year to be experimenting with the God particle or ghost portals. <laughs> yep. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to ha add any more commentary to well, this weird I do. haunted sermon? I just would like to quote the great Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park when I say, <laughs> your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Oh, I love that. Yeah, because he's right. That's what it always makes me think of. It's like... These scientists have great ideas, and of course, they are completely passionate about science. So they want to do this. I mean, I get it. I get that you want to find out what really drives this mm -hmm. whole machine called Earth and life and humanity. But there's also that thing where how do you how do you um, survive your own existence? Yeah, well, How I know you, I know yeah. that the inventor of the nuclear bomb wished he never did that. Of course. Um, yeah, it's, it's like, how do you figure out, like, you're, you're basically going into a room and it's pitch black and you're feeling your way along the wall because you're trying to figure out your surroundings. Mm -hmm. But at any point, you might just step on the, the detonator do. that blows everything to smithereens. So... It's, it's, I guess there's got to be a lot of trust and 
based off of what you have said today, it makes me feel like there's probably some kind of energy or other force that's trying to Prevent slow them, them down mm -hmm. and be like, no, 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 you are really stepping in where you shouldn't. And I've heard those horror stories and fear stories about CERN for a long time. Like right. it the potential it has to be very, very, very bad. And just the fact that this really is a gigantic ghost machine. It 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 makes sense. Do you think sense that's where our ghosts come from? Is CERN? No, I I really think it. Obviously, there has to be paranormal activity there because mm -hmm. it's just a gigantic electromagnetic entity that hums, has resonance. Yeah. I mean, it's just everything. And it's cold. The murder of Jacqueline de Wallaby is a tragedy that has puzzled and polarized the minds of those who know it. Over the past six months, we've extensively investigated this case, trawling through files, trial transcripts, and archives, and have been conducting interviews with the people who lived through it. It was a sensational, startling fact that a seven-year-old little girl had shown up missing from a suburban home. Something like that happening would have never crossed our parents' minds. The notion that a stranger can slip into a child's bedroom in the middle of the night, completely undetected, is surely a notion that every single parent on this earth fears. But what's even more lamentable is knowing that a child killer is roaming the street, and even more chilling, they could be someone you know. Hosted by Emily G. Thompson and Eileen McFarlane, this is... The Shattered Window. Picture it, Carol. It's 1954, and President Dwight D. Eisenhower oh. is sitting in his armchair at the Oval Office trying to decide what to do about the Cold War the United States is having with Russia. The U.S. had been sending spy planes to fly over Russia to check out on their technological advancements and possible overall threat to the United States. However, these spy planes were flying too low to the ground and were in danger of being recognized and shot down by the Soviets. So Eisenhower needed a better way to collect this information. Hence, he calls in a couple of CIA agents to help him find a place somewhere in the United States where the U.S. government could design and develop secret aircraft that could not be recognized nor shot down. Oh, I know where this is. So he could spy on Russia in peace. <laughs> <laughs> the two agents looked at each other and smiled. No problem, they said, and promptly bought two airline tickets to the great state of Nevada. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let's face it. These CIA agents just wanted to go to Nevada to do some gambling and party. Oh, right. So they go, and after all the drinking and gambling and hookers and blow, they wake up the <laughs> next morning with a terrible hangover, but they still have a job to do. So they call up a local real estate agent and say... Yes, we are from the federal government and we are looking for like a really big piece of land for secret government stuff. The creepier, the better. The real estate agent nods and says, come with me. What they find is a rather large piece of unoccupied land that turned out to be about the same size as Connecticut, <laughs> deep in the Nevada desert, <clears throat> just 120 miles northwest of Las Vegas. Hence, the birthplace of the Nevada Test and Training yes. Range, otherwise known as Area, Area 51. 51. <laughs> Yay, All Area right. 51. I was hoping. <clears throat> oh, that's great. It's a good one. I mean, I'm not even that into aliens, but I'm realizing that on the show, I've talked about the Phoenix Lights. Um, I think there was another, like, the Skinwalker Ranch, like, all these alien stories. Well, a lot of people feel paranormal things are from aliens. Oh, I do, too. But yeah. I'm more of, like, I'm, I'm probably more into ghosts and witches. Me, but, too. Me but, too. But the alien stuff is getting really compelling yeah. and very interesting. It's because they're back. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I've been, like, looking into it. I'm like, the more I read about this, the more I'm becoming more into the alien stuff now. So that's kind of been fun for me to right. uh, discover my inner alien desire. Um, so why is it called Area 51, you ask? Um, 
Do I ask? Yeah. Thanks for asking, Carol. Yes, Holly, please do tell. <laughs> I would have thought it would be because of the 50 states. It would be named Area 50. It is called Area 51 because the entire base at the Nevada Test and Training Range is segmented into different block-shaped areas. Each block-shaped area was assigned a number. So you guessed it, the block-shaped area of the base that gets so much attention that apparently holds all of the secrets of extraterrestrial life, saucy spaceships, and carnal knowledge of alien bodies is the place they call it Area 51. It sits on the northeast corner of the base and has a lovely view of Groom Lake and the foothills behind it. And in fact, it is believed that some of these mountain ranges surrounding the base were dug into and used to hide some of these famed spaceships. Yeah, like space tunnels in the mountain. So the Nevada Test and Training Range was actually opened in 1940. And though I think my story about it being discovered by drunken high CIA agents is a better one, as it turns out, the base already existed when it was selected to build these secret spy planes that Eisenhower had indeed requested. They were detonating nuclear bombs at the Nevada base, so the government believed it would be the perfect place for secret plane building because no one would go close to it. One plane that was built there was the U-2 spy plane. Uh, the U-2 spy plane was built to fly 70,000 feet up in the air and travel 3,000 miles without having to refuel. This got them deep into Russian territory without being recognized. They were too high up. And they could go Sweet. for a long time and not have to come back and land and fuel back up. However, that didn't stop the Soviets from shooting down a U-2 spy plane in 1960, which made the Americans have to fess up to the fact that they were indeed spying on the Russians. Awkward. Very awkward <laughs> indeed. Therefore, the pressure was on to build a plane that flew even higher up in the sky to avoid detection because us honest Americans wanted to make sure that next time we flew over Russia to collect their secrets, we would not be caught. They just needed <laughs> to have used remote viewers. Come on. I know, right? Yeah. They probably were. <laughs> that led to the creation of the SR-71 Blackbird. It could fly 80,000 feet in the air and go over 2,100 miles per hour. So wow. no one could see it and no one could catch it. Booyah! Take that, Russia! USA! USA! Oh, okay. USA! Holly! <laughs> you, you know you know, I'm right. I know. Okay. That's pretty cool. I do love that plane, by the way. Yeah. My dad was a pilot in the Air Force, so I'm, I'm into planes. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. So as these spy planes developed, so did the base at Area 51. More buildings and people populated the base to work on the planes. Employees had to fly in and out of the base. Everything was kept hush-hush because they were in the business of building secret spy planes after all. However, there was just one glitch. They would test out their new spy planes over the Nevada desert where the general public would see them. People were witnessing these strange quote-unquote objects that moved faster and higher than anyone had seen before. The people of Nevada were seeing UFOs, yeah. even though they were just technically secret spy planes. Area 51 started to take on an ominous presence and developed a reputation of being a hotbed of alien activity. And the government loved this because, after all, the alien theory was way better than if the public knew the truth, that secret spy planes were being developed at the base. Yeah. So the government let the alien myth perpetuate. The top secret nature of the base, surrounded by fences and giant trespassing signs and armed guards and the like, also helped to make it very clear that there was something very big being kept under wraps at the Nevada Test and Training Range. The rumors remained as such until 1980 when a book called The Roswell Incident was published and really cemented Area 51's reputation for alien activity. The book claimed that the nuclear surveillance weather balloon crash of 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico was actually an alien spaceship crash that was covered up by the U.S. government. It bolstered the idea that the military was at work in the southwest United States on secret alien spaceships. So, of course, people started to apply the idea that the crash debris from Roswell was carted off to Area 51 for further examination and tests. Flash forward to 1982, when a young physicist working at the Los Alamos lab in New Mexico named Robert quote unquote Bob Lazar yes, decides Bob to put Lazar. a jet engine in his Honda. <laughs> That's a smart guy. Smart guy. So he puts a jet engine into his Honda. This peculiar idea caught the attention of the local newspaper. They published a story about Bob Lazar and his jet propulsion car seen riding around town. <laughs> 
The story broke on what happened to be the same day that Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb, was giving a talk at the Los Alamos lab. Lazar decided to attend the talk. When he arrived, he noticed that Teller was standing alone reading a newspaper, the same paper in which Lazar was heavily featured in his jet propulsion car. He took that as his in and introduced himself to Teller as the guy featured in the newspaper. The two had a nice chat and then that was it. Until a few years later, in 1988, Lazar was looking for a job. So he sent his resume to Ed Teller and reminded him of their meeting. Teller remembered Lazar and gave him a name to contact to see about a job. Hence, Lazar applied for a job at a contracting company called EG&G for an advanced propulsion job of some sort. Very generic job description, working for the government, yada, yada, yada. They told them it would be out in the middle of the Nevada desert with a somewhat unpredictable work schedule. Lazar said that sounded great. He is hired and he begins work at an area he calls S4, which he says is about 15 miles south of Area 51 and is considered to be a subset of Area 51. Early on, when Lazar was hired, he said he was walking through a hangar one day and he sees a flying saucer with an American flag sticker stuck to it. He laughs to himself thinking, oh, UFOs are just secret airplanes that the U.S. government has secretly developed and that's all that they are, right? Right, right. However, a little while later, he is introduced to his lab partner, Barry. Barry starts to show Lazar around and the kind of technology he and Barry were supposed to study and reverse engineer together. So they were working with a force field that was fueled somehow by a gravity, and that gravity was a wave. That was odd, thought Lazar, since human beings don't have a grip on how to use gravity as a propulsion force. Mm -hmm. In fact, humans don't have a firm understanding of gravity at all, nor has it ever been determined to be a wave. He started to realize that the technology that they were working with was not man-made, and most likely not even of this earth. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's when Lazar realized, holy shit, that was a real motherfucking spaceship I set out in the hair. <laughs> Thus began a two-year odyssey in which Lazar got to learn about, study, and even go inside a real-life UF motherfucking O. So Lazar was bedazzled by the things he saw and experienced at this job. He had a security level called Majestic, which gave him very unique and very limited access. He said he saw at least nine different types of spaceships in one of the hangars. He was never allowed to ask questions or linger or look for too long. He was on a need-to-know basis and was not allowed to share his studies with anybody but Barry and their senior advisor. He was able to study how the UFO was able to move, which he said was by bending space around it and then falling through the space. He said, picture it as if you had a bowling ball on a bed. Then you put your foot and fist down in front of the ball and push down. The bowling ball would roll towards your foot and fist. He said that is how a spaceship would work. The space would somehow bend around it and the spaceship would just drop through. He said that humanity has no idea how to do this, which is why he was hired, to help try to figure it out. He was even allowed to go inside a real spaceship. He said it was quite small, and he couldn't even stand straight up inside of it except for the center. He said the seats were quite small, too. He did not see any screens or computer systems, but the ship did have archways that it acted like screens at times. Oh, so they're, so these little... Um spaceships were probably for the grays because aren't those the little the little ones yeah yeah for sure um the ship also had no hard angles and that everything just kind of melded together and it was all like a pewter gray color it was all the same color Mm. which you know so they're not using like um platinum or i don't know they were using some kind of silver some kind of material i don't think that was Mm -hmm. of this world Um, Lazar indicated that the name of the element that was used as fuel for the spaceships was called element 115, which was an element that at the time did not exist on our periodic table of elements. Element 115, which looks like a copper triangle, produced its own gravitational energy and was able to bend the gravity around the spaceship so the spaceship could move, which it did belly first. So the spaceships move with their bellies moving forward. In the many interviews he has given on this subject, Lazar is able to speak in great detail. In fact, much more detail than I'm going to go into here. He is able to diagram what the spaceship looked like and how element 115 would work. He said it could also bend light around the spaceship so you couldn't actually see it if you were standing directly underneath it, which would make sense if you, if they could like fly around the Earth and you just can't see them. 
Right. So maybe they are around and we just don't know that they're, that they're there. Hmm. Lazar also remembered that when he would go to work at S4, they had to use a bone scanner to get into the building. The idea was you would lay your hand on top of a board that was lined with pins and this light would come down and scan your hand. What it was doing was measuring your bone length, which acted as like a fingerprint of sorts. He said he had never seen anything like it before. So it wasn't an x-ray. It was something even different than that. Right. Bob Lazar worked at the base for two years. You see, because Lazar was allowed to participate in the most top secret of top secrets, the government kept a very close eye on him and the rest of their quote-unquote employees. The government had discovered, by wiretapping Lazar's phone, that Bob's wife was having an affair. (laughs) Because they felt like his home life had been stressful, the government decided to cut Lazar's hours at the lab. He took this as a flag that something was wrong, as he had no idea that his wife was having an affair, and he also had no idea why they would cut his hours back from a job that he loved. Lazar was worried that after being exposed to such big secrets that perhaps he should share this information with his friends, you know, for insurance, that if anything happened to him, they would know what and why. Mm, Smart. Uh, Lazar had been given access to the test flight schedule for the spaceships. So he started tracking his friends out to the test site in the evening so they could witness the saucers up in the sky. He got away with it, too, a couple of times. But then on his third trip, he finally got caught. He was pulled into a debriefing and told he was in trouble. Again, a little freaked out by what he knew, Lazar decided he needed to go to the public with the information again to make sure he couldn't just be taken out because of what he knew. Mm -hmm. So he was debriefed and told, you're done here, dude. And he was like, oh, my God, they're not going to just let me go get another Mm -hmm. job knowing what I know. So he decides to contact Las Vegas investigative reporter George Knapp, Uh as we all love from Coast to Coast AM, and started spilling his guts about what really goes on at Area 51. So, of course, George Knapp went about the business of trying to determine if this Bob Lazar guy was legit. For instance, Lazar told Knapp that he had gone to college at Caltech and MIT, but when uh, Knapp checked that out, no record of Lazar was was there ever attending their school. However, Knapp was able to find friends that vouched for Lazar that he did indeed attend and graduate from those schools. Um, Next, Knapp tried to confirm Lazar was an employee of EG&G and again was told Lazar never worked there. He then tried to confirm Lazar's appointment at the Los Alamos lab. Again, he was told, sorry, we don't know him. The problem was Lazar had been written up in the local paper in multiple articles as being an employee at the Los Alamos lab during his jet engine car days and his name was included in an employee directory for the lab during the times he claimed to work there so they had evidence that he was there but they all denied he was there so they're trying to fabricate that he's a liar at this point in my opinion i think he's telling the truth and they're just trying to erase his history yeah so was he telling the truth it just so happens many of the things that lazar claimed were true turned out to be true well, true yeah yeah they, they came true they did come true in 2003, the element unimpentium was synthesized and later named Muscovium. They claimed to have discovered this element during a nuclear fusion experiment. So in 2013, the researchers at Lund University in Sweden added the element to the periodic table as, you guessed it, element 115. Mm-hmm. In 2015, scientists again discovered that gravity is actually a wave when they observed two black holes merge and it produced the gravitational wave. That means Lazar predicted gravitational waves 26 years prior to science discovering their existence. Wow. Um, and the bone scanner Lazar said he used to get into S4, that was also confirmed to exist and is used as security technology at the checkpoint to enter the Nellis range close to where S4 is located. Lazar was also interviewed by a police officer and given four credibility tests. He passed them all. Lazar has claimed to have been harassed, threatened, shot at, raided, attacked, you named it, all in the name of getting the story out to the public. He said many of his friends were audited by the IRS. Other friends in high-level jobs had their security clearances pulled. But his story has not changed, and when you watch him speak of it, he certainly does not come across as someone who is lying. He believes that the government wants his information kept secret because whichever government has the ability to create and use gravity and develop force fields wins. He said that Mm. there were Russian scientists working on the base, but one day the Americans made a huge discovery. He doesn't know what it was, but after that, the Russians were no longer allowed back on the base. 
So he's basically saying whoever in humanity figures out gravity, how to use it in the way that these spaceships do, will be able to dominate the entire planet. And that's why it is so important that this ability to control and manipulate gravity in this way gives you all the cards. You get to you get to run your ships, you get to control all the armies because no one can stop you. There's no way to be stopped with this technology. So um, he also said that we are so far behind in this technology that what he thinks happens is that um, they will work on something for a while and they can't get there and they can't get there. And so they put it away and 10 years go by and they pull it back out and see if humanity's technology is advanced enough to get a little bit further with it each time. He also said that when he got hired to work there, he was replacing somebody who had been killed during one of the experiments because, oh, no. because they will, they don't know what they're doing with it. He's like, it's like taking, um, you know, he was, it's, it's, we don't know what we're doing. So it's very easy to accidentally get killed trying to study this stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very dangerous work. If you want more information on Bob Lazar and his story, then check out the Netflix documentary called Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers. Or of course, watch Joe Rogan's interview with Bob Lazar on YouTube, which I'll post up on our website. So in the wise worlds of Mr. Bob Lazar, to all of you young people out there who aren't sure what to believe in, Bob says, just pay attention. Yes. Oh, my gosh. That was so good. That's um, Area 51. Hi, Hill. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I need an edit, please. Edit in aisle four. Aisle four. <laughs> Holy hell, Holly, how have you been? Uh, well, Carol, I've been better. It seems that the whole planet is okay. We're moving all the time. on. <laughs> <laughs> so back to weird science. Weird science. Uh, uh. <laughs> I know. I'd I thought have... it was a hydrogen. What the well, hell is a hadron? Oh, I will say I don't okay. know, but it's hadronic. It's. <sighs> Oh, all right, whatever. I'm, I'm already lost. <laughs> I thought I knew this CERN business like the back of my hand. Okay, you know what? And I don't. I know nothing. Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Sorry, everyone, everyone. Just be patient with the Carol. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about science. <laughs> Weird science. In 2003, the element unimpentium was since... So, fuck. As the flames die down, do remain. Though all hitchhikers are ghosts, and all dolls are definitely haunted. Hey guys, be sure to follow us on Instagram. Our handle is at Fireside Phantoms. If you have a spooky story you would like to share with us, send it to firesidephantoms at gmail.com and you may hear it on a future episode. <laughs> <laughs>